The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents International Focus, a weekly discussion of the people and events behind today's global headlines. Support provided by Milwaukee Public Television and the UWM Center for International Education. Now here's your host, Doug Savage. Welcome to International Focus. Our topic today, the politics of pandemics. When we think of government's preparedness for and response to pandemic disease, images of health officials and lab codes peering into microscopes may come to mind. Recent outbreaks have shown, however, that when disease crosses borders, science cannot be immunized against politics. To help explain the dynamics of these often contentious global health negotiations, we're joined by a frontline practitioner of what might be called disease diplomacy. Ambassador John Lang is Senior Program Officer for Developing Country Policy and Advocacy in the Global Health Program of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Before joining the foundation in 2009, he had a distinguished diplomatic career, including posts as Deputy Chief of Mission and Chargé d'Affaires at the U.S. Embassy in Tanzania. His performance during the 1998 terrorist bombing there earned him the State Department's Distinguished Honor Award for Skilled Leadership and Extraordinary Courage. He also served as U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of Botswana and most recently as Special Representative on Avian and Pandemic Influenza. Ambassador Lang, welcome to International Focus. Thank you very much, Doug. Well, I think uh, one question we could start with is how does a diplomat get into the bug game? <laughs> I, uh, I did not have any medical training uh, when I uh, uh, joined the Foreign Service. Uh, in fact, I had a law degree from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, uh, as well as an undergraduate degree in political science uh, from UW-Madison. Uh, it was only when I got in my Foreign Service career to Botswana, where I served as ambassador, as you mentioned, that I started focusing on health issues because uh, Botswana had uh, 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 so many wonderful things going for it uh, as a country in southern Africa, but it had a very serious problem of HIV infection, and, and uh, uh, there were estimates of one fourth to one third of all adults aged 15 to 49 being HIV positive. Just a really serious situation, and that's when I started getting into health issues through HIV/AIDS. Later on, worked at the uh, 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 as part of uh, the. President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief. I was the Deputy Global AIDS Coordinator when that began. Uh, and because of that health experience, uh, it, it was uh, 2006, uh, uh, early that year, uh, the President of the United States, uh, President Bush, was, uh, and, the, and the White House were very concerned about the potential for a uh, pandemic uh, virus uh, from the H5N1 virus uh, 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 and possibly causing a worldwide pandemic with uh, tens of millions of lives to be lost. And uh, the State Department, uh, uh, an undersecretary of state, asked me, based on my previous health experience in other areas, if I could work on uh, the global health diplomacy aspects of preparing for that possible pandemic. So uh, let's start with some basic terms. And what, when does a, an outbreak become an epidemic? Which could become a pandemic. I mean, how, how do they differ? The, the, it becomes. A, a, you can have outbreaks from um, uh, diseases, but when it bec uh, when you have an influenza virus, and the transmission goes from human to human, in what they call a sustained and efficient manner, uh, and it keeps spreading and spreading and spreading and becomes global, that becomes a pandemic. And the, uh, so the two key aspects are sustained, it has to keep going, and efficient. And by efficient, actually, if it, if it kills people immediately, it will probably snuff itself out in whatever village or locality that it started. It's when you have some people die from it and probably many more uh, suffer, who suffer from it can live that it can keep going and going and going. So it's a, it's a technical uh, uh, explanation that the uh, health people uh, use, but uh, the the, asp the idea of this really being pervasive and global uh, is the pandemic that we feared. So the the two aspects I would think for policymakers are preparing for the next one and responding to the current one. Uh, we'll get to the response part of the equation in a bit, but 
Talk a little bit about how a place like Botswana or, or some of the other places you've served might uh, prepare for a pandemic. It, um, it's very interesting because uh, when I was the special representative on avian and pandemic influenza, we, were, we had a series of international conferences at the ministerial level, meaning uh, at the, the Secretary of Health and Human Services from the United States, ministers of health from countries around the world. And the, uh, the, the, the industrialized countries, uh, Europe, uh, Japan, Australia, the United States, Canada, and others, uh, tended to be very focused on some uh, uh, very serious uh, uh, planning uh, efforts because they were very concerned about how this would affect the populace. But in, in a lot of the developing countries, the, the poorer countries of the world, they had so many overwhelming health issues, they really couldn't put the same amount of effort into planning for something that may or may not occur. And in fact, that's one of the fundamental issues when you talk about uh, planning for a pandemic, is you really don't know when it's going to happen. Uh, there were three pandemics in the 20th century. The first of those in 1918 killed an estimated 30 or 40 million people. And you, 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 you don't know when that kind of pandemic will occur. So you want to prepare for whatever pandemic may, may happen. But when you're in a developing country and you have people who may be dying of HIV AIDS or malaria, tuberculosis, measles, polio, et cetera, uh, it's very hard to place this as a high priority. So while those countries uh, in the developing world did create plans, they were nowhere near as elaborate as the ones in, in many of the industrialized countries. And uh, what is the role for the various levels of government? I mean, I, I would assume that the first people that notice this thing is, is not the Ministry of Health in the capital, but uh, you know, the, the local folks. Yes, and in fact, uh, even in the United States, where we have our, our federal system, that we had uh, divisions, uh, or not uh, uh, divisions necessarily, but the, but we had uh, uh, different levels of engagement. The, the federal government was very engaged, uh, as I mentioned. It was really an imperative that was driven by the White House, uh, starting in 2005, uh, when we first became aware of how serious this H5N1 pandemic possibly could be. But then there was a national implementation plan and a national strategy that it had to involve all the states uh, because uh, uh, they were the ones who would really uh, uh, have to lead because they're the ones who are dealing with the health in their uh, uh, borders. And then within that, within each state, you'd have the, the community hospitals, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's an effort that, that had to be done at, all, at various levels, but at the same time, was, uh, the farther away you got from uh, that center of, of concern, the more difficult it was to, to be engaged. And, and I, in a lot of the developing countries, as uh, you mentioned, it was really, uh, uh, the, yes, the Ministry of Health would be engaged, but often out in the villages and the communities, there wasn't much pandemic preparedness planning. Well, and, and as you say, it, it can be, somewhat resource intensive. If you have very scarce resources that you have to deploy with the current problems, it's, it's hard to make the case, however justifiable, that you, know, you need to allocate them for something that may or may not happen. So uh, what is the mechanism through which the alarm bells start ringing at, uh, say, at, at HHS here, at, at Health and Human Services? I mean, when do we know that there's a, a problem coming down the pike? Uh, there's a, 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 the, the key to this is uh, what, uh, what the health experts call surveillance, where you have uh, efforts uh, the, uh, and systems in place to detect any anomalies in the health of the citizenry. And you, ideally, someday, you know, this world will have that all over the world. Right now, of course, there are varying levels of surveillance. And in fact, there's a new international standard that was uh, adopted in 2005 called the International Health Regulations. They were revised and approved in 2005 that form that fundamental uh, uh, emphasis on surveillance. The idea is to detect, assess, uh, and respond to uh, any kind of uh, a, a anomalous event that could be a public health emergency of international concern, not just in the country itself. So for a pandemic, if you start having a series of people die, uh, you, you immediately, these alarm bells start going off. And 
with the H5N1 virus, the bird flu virus, as it was called uh, uh, in 2005, 2006, 2007, there were people who died. Hundreds of people actually ended up dying from that virus. But almost all of them died because they were very close to the source of the virus, uh, which was often chickens. The concern is when, it, uh, when this virus mutates or reassorts and then becomes uh, a, a virus that can go from person to person. And that did happen in a few cases, but very few. When you have person to person transmission, that's when the alarm bells really go off because then you could uh, have that lead to a pandemic. And are there instances in which there's an incentive not to ring the alarm bells if, if you're the impacted country? Uh, is there a reason I, I wouldn't want to disclose my surveillance results? Uh, well, as I said, the international health regulations require it, uh, but uh, it, 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 when it's a public health emergency that could be of international concern, that it really could spread. But um, if you have a, a big tourist industry uh, and you want to keep attracting tourists and you think this isn't really going to be a pandemic, there could be an incentive to, to hide it. Uh, I can't say that there isn't, uh, but, uh, but the, one of the main emphases that the U.S. government had was to ensure that there was transparency and there was disclosure on this because uh, it really uh, could have someday affect the health of the globe. And what is the... the sort of mechanism for coordination among these national governments? I mean, is there a role for, for multilateral groups like you know, the World Health Organization? Or what role do they play in, in having all of this work? This was where it was quite interesting and why my background in diplomacy uh, was relevant even though I wasn't the health expert. Uh, we had a lot of health experts, of course, working with us from the uh, uh, Department of Health and Human Services, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, U.S. Agency for International Development, uh, and, uh, and on the agriculture or the animal health side uh, from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. But the, this was an a problem of animal health. It was a problem in chickens that w the potential was to transfer to human health uh, and then someday become this uh, human pandemic that we discussed. So it involved not only the World Health Organization internationally, but also the Food and Agriculture Organization because they deal with animal health issues. And the World Organization for Animal Health, known as OIE, based on its French initials, uh, which is based in Paris. And then the UN Secretary General created a UN system influenza coordinator because this uh, concern that affected animal health, the potential for human health, and then would have a global uh, uh, impact was something that involved uh, all different aspects of, uh, uh, of the UN system and in fact of the US government or any government because it wasn't just a health issue. Well, it's just about time for a break. When we come back, I'd like to focus a little bit uh, more specifically on your experience uh, with Indonesia and others at the table. But first, we'll take a short break and be right back with more International Focus. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back. We're talking the politics of pandemics with Ambassador John Lang from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Well, one of the, uh, the recent situations you had a, a prominent role in is, as we were discussing, the, uh, the avian flu outbreak. And what was your role as, as a diplomat? I mean, we've talked a little bit about surveillance, about assessing the, the situation, but where does the diplomacy come in? Well, one of the more fascinating aspects of a pandemic is how it, it, uh, if you have a truly serious pandemic, uh, uh, like the one that was in 1918, you end up having all elements of society affected. It's not just a health issue because you have to deal with, uh, the, uh, with so many aspects of it. When a, a pandemic first begins and it comes from abroad, 
Does that mean we should close our borders? Does that mean that we uh, no longer let uh, uh, anyone in because we're fearful and we want to keep it outside the United States? Well, we did a lot of studies on that and determined that it really wouldn't have much impact at all if you tried to do it. Eventually, it would come to the United States. It was inevitable. Um, you had issues of financial services. It, it, our estimates in the U.S. government were that 40% of the workforce would be out of work, or would, would not come to work at the peak of a pandemic in any particular community. If 40% of the workforce at the nuclear reactors is out, what does that mean for the, for the nuclear reactor industry? If 40% of the firefighters are, are out or police officers are out, what does that mean for security in the community? Uh, if 40% of the financial services uh, uh, sector is out, what does that mean for those who even fill the ATM machines with uh, money, et cetera? And that 40% could be those who were sick themselves or, have, or died. It could mean uh, those those who were at home caring for loved ones who were sick or those who were just fearful for going to work. So it turned out that all elements of the U.S. government were involved in one way or another uh, in this pandemic planning, some more than others, of course. But there were exercises within the financial services sector as to how to keep the, mach the machinery of, it, uh, of the financial services going uh, in the midst of a pandemic and many other uh, uh, sectors also. So, uh, just from a, a clinical perspective, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, typically what you want to get is a, a sample of the bugs and then you turn it over to people who can make the vaccine. Is that, that more or less in broad terms what we want to do? Yes, but, the, but uh, now there's work uh, and there's hope someday there will be a universal vaccine and we won't be so concerned about this. But until that happens, uh, there, it was really an old-fashioned egg-based technology that would occur and that you would have, uh, once, the, uh, once this pandemic began, it would take about four months before the first vaccines were available, which is why everyone was so concerned about how to prepare for this uh, 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 that period before anyone could be vaccinated. That's why uh, uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, before I started working there, uh, ended up doing some uh, uh, research on this in terms of what it would take to produce uh, stockpiles of what, what they called a pre-pandemic vaccine or at least some uh, uh, antiviral therapy that would allow people to, be, uh, to mitigate the uh, conditions that would occur. Because until the vaccine was available, which would be at least four months into the pandemic, everyone was at risk. Well, and uh, if I am the, the unfortunate country of origin of this virus, in a certain way, it gives me a, a fair amount of leverage, does it not, over that process? If I say, well, maybe I don't want to share my virus with you. Uh, yes, and in fact, that was an issue that, uh, that came up. Uh, uh, Indonesia was uh, a, a source of much of the H5N1 virus in chickens. Um, it was really widespread there. And because of that, uh, they were very concerned that they were sharing the virus through the normal uh, system, which was then called the Global Influenza Surveillance Network of, for around the world. They were sharing it, but they were concerned if, that if a pandemic ever did start, they wouldn't get the vaccines in return because the vaccine manufacturers, many of whom were in the, uh, the, the developed world, would first take care of the, the rich countries. They're, and they were very concerned about that. So they decided to stop sharing the viruses that were uh, being uh, uh, that they had been sharing for monitoring purposes because uh, what happens is the experts want to monitor any changes, any mutations in this virus to see if we're closer and closer to a pandemic. Indonesia stopped sharing that in December 2006, uh, which rang alarm bells in the United States actually uh, and many other countries because we were very concerned about a possible pandemic and, uh, and we wanted to monitor how close we were getting to one. When Indonesia stopped sharing its samples, uh, it, it led to some very uh, extensive negotiations under the auspices of the World Health Organization. Well, and uh, if memory serves, they, they took a novel approach that you could appreciate as a, a, an alum of UW Law School. They invoked the Convention on Biodiversity, did they not? And saying, this, this is our, our novel and unique biological resource that we don't have to share with anybody if we don't want. Yes, and uh, we uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, the, uh, we in the U.S. government were quite concerned because um, the Convention on Biological uh, Resources, uh, uh, which uh, is uh, for countries which are a party to it, uh, is intended to 
encourage biological diversity, here we're dealing with a pathogen. We're dealing with something that kills people or has the potential to do so. And uh, the idea is you don't want to have that kind of diversity. You want to kill it. Uh, so uh, it, uh, but, but it was, it was a very interesting issue because the, what it ended up being called in a, in a microcosm was sample sharing and benefit sharing. The idea of sharing samples of this pandemic influenza virus or potential pandemic influenza virus with the experts at CDC and, and in other parts of the world, but then in return benefiting those who had provided the virus and other developing countries. And so the sample sharing and benefit sharing debate went on. The U.S. position and many other countries uh, in the in, um, a developed world have felt that this, sh that this benefits should be provided on a voluntary basis, and we wanted to be generous in that regard. But Indonesia, and then it was joined by others uh, after a while, was insisting that it be mandatory, that if, we're, we're, if we share our samples with you, we have to get benefits back on a mandatory basis. So what would be the, the enforcement mechanism for an agreement like that? The, uh, well, in the end, it took four years, and I was the lead negotiator, or one of the lead negotiators in the U.S. government for the first two years of this, but it took four years. And in the end, when this was finally resolved in uh, May of 2011 at the World Health Assembly in Geneva, the enforcement mechanism is actually a contract, uh, in a sense, a, a memorandum of understanding that is that, a, 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 that, that it, by which a company that, is, that receives the virus, a, comp oh, a company could be also universities or others, but a company that receives the virus from CDC a, will have to sign a contract uh, that it will then provide benefits to this uh, broader program to help developing countries in the event of a pandemic, or it won't be able to receive the virus. It ended up not being a treaty, in other words. It's actually a contractual mechanism, but it serves the same purpose. And uh, is, is supply typically a problem in these situations, or is it just sort of maldistribution? There's too much of it in one place and not, not enough of it in another. The fundamental issue with the, uh, the current technology, since we still don't have a universal vaccine, the, the fundamental issue is uh, insufficient supply of a vaccine. Since, as I said, you can't even start making it uh, uh, or, or, or distributing it until about four months into a pandemic. Uh, you will end up, uh, you, you then end up having that shortage which could go on for months and months and months after that uh, until finally the world is, is uh, uh, vaccinated. And because you, you can't, you have to quickly try to produce this uh, vaccine. And it's a very, uh, if you have people dying at the rate of, uh, uh, that they were in 1918 and tens of millions of people are dead, you're gonna find the world begging for this vaccine and there won't be enough of it initially. Well, and, and there, does, does national interest trump sort of humanitarian goals? If, if I'm fortunate enough to be the, the country in which the, the big pharma company is domicile that manufactures this stuff, it, there's a certain incentive for us not to share it, isn't there? Uh, it's a fundamental concern, and that was the concern a lot of developing countries, including Indonesia, had, that, that, that in the end, we, we in the United States would not share. We were committed to doing that, and I think you can look at what the uh, Obama administration did uh, in um, uh, 2009 as a good example. When the H1N1 pandemic did occur, it wasn't the terrible pandemic we had feared from H5N1. It was a milder pandemic, but until we knew how, that it was uh, going to be a, a mild pandemic, w th there was great fear. You can just look at the headlines from April, May, June of 2009, very serious concern. And what the Obama administration did with about another 10 uh, donors was to agree to give up to 10% of the vaccine that was being produced for H1N1 to the World Health Organization to give to developing countries. And, and how does that work if I'm the CEO of the pharma company who says, well, somebody's got to pay for this stuff. I'm not just going to put it on a pallet and ship it off. Well, the idea they would get, they would be paid for it, but, by... it, was, but it was a contribution by the United States and other donor governments. Uh, but the idea was to demonstrate that there was the need in the developing world for this. It wasn't just something that the United States alone could keep for itself or others. Uh, and in fact, there's a mutuality here. If, if the United States were to have a policy, no, we're going to only care about ourselves first, then 
clearly other countries that, when uh, the poorer countries, if they get the virus, are not going to want to share it with us. So, uh, it mean, and, and that would mean there a delay in being able to even produce the vaccine to save lives in the United States. There's a mutuality of interest to have that sharing, and I think that was pretty clearly demonstrated. In a, uh, from my perspective, I hope a precedent was set in 2009 by the Obama administration's initiative. Well, we've got uh, probably 30 seconds left, but. Uh how would you compare the the response to to the two the the H five N one and the H one N one the avian versus the the most recent outbreak? Actually, we we prepared for the H five N one because we thought it was going to be so serious. We ended up having a milder uh, one through H one N one when it, a pandemic actually did occur, but. Uh, many people who have worked on this, such as myself, believe that it really, that the, the response was much better because of the preparations that had been done earlier. Well, Ambassador John Lang, thank you very much. To our viewers, we'll see you next time on International Focus. For information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220 or visit us at our website.